thank you for inviting me to speak. It's a real honor to be here. And it's an honor, an honor to be here with Hash because um, I think it's fair to say that between us, you know, in London, we have really changed prostate cancer care globally. And uh, more about that from Hash uh, shortly as well for the surgical advances and the diagnosis advances. I think one of the big things to say is that over the last 10 to 15 years, we've really completely changed the textbooks on uh, prostate cancer uh, treatment, diagnosis, management, but also understanding of these diseases. And to cover that in 20 minutes is going to be challenging, so I will have to go fast, but I will try and give you a high-level overview of all the things we've led on. These are my disclosures. So introduction, just for you that don't work in this space, is the commonest cancer globally. It's not just a European or, you know, um, a Western world disease. It's a very common disease in places like Nigeria, uh, parts of, of China, and it's increasing in incidence. Um, some prostate cancers are indolent and need no treatment. And in fact, this is one of the major advances in the last decade. We now know that there are patients that don't need therapy, which is you know great, the more indolent disease, prostate cancers. Some prostate cancers are locally advanced and can be cured. Um, you know, and that's a really important thing with you know cure rates of approximately 90% by either radiotherapy with hormones or surgery. About a third of prostate cancers are very aggressive. If they spread early, they remain incurable, with half of them being metastatic at diagnosis, 15% of the overall. This is really the commonest cancer globally and the second commonest killer from cancer um, in men, uh, with more than 12,000 deaths, which is increasing in the UK. The only treatment until 20 years ago was really hormonal deprivation. And the hormone deprivation research led to two Nobel Prizes, as you can see here below. The prostate is essentially, you know, walnut-sized um, um, or tangerine-sized uh, uh, organ under the, um, the bladder. Um, this is a PCUK uh, advert that I quite like to use in my talks because it really tells you here what we're dealing with. is the most common cancer in men. It can be, you know, it can be at inherited risk if you have a family history of cancer or prostate cancer because of genes like BRCA2 that I'll talk about later. There's an increase in uh, risk as you get older, and uh, I'm sure uh, you will hear from Hash about the symptoms this can cause. And there is quite a bit of evidence, although it's maybe a bit controversial, that African men can get more aggressive disease. You can see here, this is a global issue. It's not just uh, in Europe or the UK, although there is worse prostate cancer probably in the North, for example, of Europe compared to the South. But you will see, you know, quite a bit of, um, you know, disease, for example, in um, sub-Saharan Africa and including in China. But actually, one important factor is that, you know, even in countries where there's very high prevalence, that does not mean high mortality. For example, in North America, it can have very high prevalence and very low mortality because they're doing a lot of screening and over diagnoses uh, more inland disease because of what was known as lead time bias, which remains a really big problem for screening. The etiology of prostate cancer remains controversial, but there is clearly evidence that um, high androgen receptor signaling and defects in DNA repair that are inherited, for example, BRCA2 or ATM germline defects, increase risk. Now, what is particularly interesting is that some countries have a much, much higher risk. For example, in the Caribbean, in Guadalupe and Martinique, there's a 50 fold higher risk of getting prostate cancer, and it's actually related to an insecticide the structure of which is down here called chlordecone, which is actually an endocrine disruptor, probably impacts antigen receptor signaling, and importantly causes oxidative stress and inflammation in the prostate, we believe, that I think drives carcinogenesis from this compound. And sadly, even today, 20 plus years after they stopped using this insecticide in the banana plantations, the, um, the habitat is still you know, contaminated by this pesticide to kill the banana weevil. The other issue is that, you know, uh, there's a lot of evidence, particularly from about 100 years ago, that if you're a Japanese man with low risk of prostate cancer moving to the USA, like in San Francisco, within 20, 30 years, your risk of prostate cancer went from being very low to being very high in keeping with the North American uh, risk. And presumably this means that the diet or the exposure to um, carcinogenic processes is really, you know, really important in causing this disease. 
Okay, so that's the background. You know, I think the first thing to say is we really have transformed prostate cancer care with multiple drugs. And I really don't have time to go through these in detail in 20 minutes. But these in, this include a chibalin binding intravenous drug called cabazitaxel, published in the Lancet in 2010, a drug made at the ICR in Sutton called abiraterone that made hundreds of millions of dollars for CREK and my institution at the ICR, a drug called enzalutamide made at UCLA by Charles Soros that I led with my colleagues at Sloan Kettering called enzalutamide that's also changed care. Um, and uh, we've now shown that actually, you know, you can actually show that this drug cabazitaxel was the first thing I first drug that really changed the care that I led on is actually better than giving abiraterone after enzalutamide or enzalutamide after abiraterone. More recently, we've developed a drug actually that uh, we've taken to approval, which is arguably the first molecularly targeted drug for a subset of the prostate cancer. They're not all the same. There are many subtypes of prostate cancer with DNA repair defects. This is a drug made in Cambridge, UK. Uh, developed initially by a biotech called Kudos, who I worked with. My work led to Kudos buying AstraZeneca, uh, AstraZeneca buying Kudos for two hundred and fifty million um, pounds. And this drug is now approved for ovarian cancer, prostate cancer, based on this uh, New England paper that we published, um, I think, four years ago now. And this drug is now being widely used as well. And most recently, we led on developing an intravenous radiotherapy called Lutetium PSMA, which is a small molecule that you give intravenously, which has got bound to it a um, heavy metal called lutetium that's radioactive, it emits electrons or beta particles that cause double-strand DNA damage to the tumor cells. So the drug is really a, a tumor-seeking intravenous injection that leads to the, the drug going to the tumor where it emits radiation to kill the tumor cells. And this is really going to transform care across the spectrum of aggressive prostate cancers. And this paper just came out this weekend in uh, keeping with uh, the ESMO conference, where we're now shown this drug not only works, as we had shown before in the post-chemotherapy setting, but in earlier um, phases of the disease, improving survival uh, for men with advanced prostate cancer. A few weeks ago at ASCO in Chicago, I showed that actually the uh, genomics of the tumor may impact the sensitivity to this radio radioactive intravenous drug uh, and these include genomic alterations of the androgen receptor, uh, the MYC gene or MYC amplification. And these genes we know can actually impact DNA repair. And basically, if you have genomic changes in the cancer that increase DNA repair, the radiotherapy drug works less. And this work now needs validated uh, to try and see if it can impact patient care. And now there's really a tsunami of new drugs there are intravenous radiotherapy drugs coming through with other radioactive payloads. They include antibodies with uh, radioactive drugs, um, chem chemicals stuck to it, other radio um, radionuclides chemicals with um, radioactive drug stuck to it or chemical, including actinium. Uh, the first one was lutetium. We now have actinium, which is an alpha particle emitter and lead and copper. Lead is quite exciting because it emits both alpha and beta particles. The alpha particles are much heavier, they're helium-like, and um, they um, have a lot more energy than the beta particles. So I think the first thing to say is our work, and this is really quoting the work of the whole academic center, and you hear more about this from Hash, has really directly led to a, a complete change in understanding of prostate cancer biology by elucidating DNA repair defects in this disease, better the disease staging by MRI, better actually ways of biopsying the cancer by MRI which HASH has really um, you know, led worldwide and has changed practice worldwide. Better ways to subtype prostate cancer into different subtypes that are very different to each other and require different treatments. And better tests to follow the disease on treatment, including whole body MRI, PSMA PETs, secondary and tumor cells and secondary tumor DNA blood tests. Serially in the patient that really help us understand is the drug working or not, how much cancer has the patient got in their body? The other thing we've been studying is better understanding of the prostate cancer genomic behavior and risk of prostate cancer. And this is another New England paper we published a couple of years ago now that was a, a led through our work on PARP inhibitors that showed that many men have inherited risk of getting prostate cancer because they actually uh, are born with um, with uh, defects in their DNA repair genes like BRCA2 and ATM. And if you have advanced prostate cancer, 
you have probably about one in seven chance, depending on where you live. It's much higher in New York, for example, um, than in Seattle. And it's medium and you know, intermediate risk in London. But you've got about a one in seven chance of having an inherited defect. And if you find that inherited defect on sequencing your, your uh, germline DNA from blood or from even better from saliva, then actually there should be family cascade testing all the kids and siblings to actually try and prevent them getting cancer because they're usually one in two people with, with that gene alteration will be at cancer risk. We've also published evidence. This is a really quite a nice paper collaboration with the guys in East Southwestern in Dallas, Texas, that actually there are rare SNPs, but that are commoner to the DNA repair mutations that in the general population increase androgen receptor signaling. And this is work identified to, through 3D genome studies but these rare SNPs increase the androgen receptor function and therefore increase risk of prostate cancer. And this work is ongoing. So watch this space. We're quite excited about this work. Through a grant of $10 million from Stand Up to Cancer, I was the only non-US um, senior investigator on this trial. We've also really generated what I call the Rosetta Stone of advanced prostate cancer, allowing us to subtype different prostate cancer in different groups and focus on delivering really more personalized treatment to the uh, men with these different subtypes, suffering from different subtypes of the disease to improve outcome. And this is really changing care. And the most impressive impact has been on tumors, prostate cancers with what we call mismatch repair defects. And these cancers used to have a very bad prognosis. People were dying from them really within three or four years. And we now believe we may be able to cure many of these men, comprise about 3% of all the aggressive prostate cancers. We really think we can cure these men with immunotherapy, which probably should be given as early as possible in the history of treatment of these, uh, of these um, subjects. And here's one of my patients. This man is called Michael. You know, I know him very well. I've been seeing him for a long time. He really came to me dying uh, eight years ago. Um, he had a pelvis full of infection. He was, had aggressive and advanced prostate cancer. I saw him literally a few weeks ago. I gave him immunotherapy for his mismatch repair defective prostate cancer. And he remains in complete remission with no evidence of cancer eight years later, which for me is just, you know, one of the best things I've really ever done. So the outcomes, overall, that our work is making men live longer and better with prostate cancer. And prostate cancer, you know, that's aggressive is no longer a rapid death sentence. You can live with it for many, many years, some men, decades, in actual fact. Importantly, the treatments are getting kinder, but the treatment still involves regularly what we call chemical castration. And my dream, which I'm sure is going to happen in my lifetime, is to get to the point to give treatments that actually do not, um, or that you know prevent the patient requiring castration therapy. I think these drugs are coming with more precise therapy delivery coming for treating our, our, the people we serve. We have many exciting ongoing efforts. I'm going to talk just about a, few of, about a few of them. We have identified cell surface targets on these tumor cells that are listed here that we're now uh, developing drugs against, and there are many in clinical trials at my center. And this is actually work that we published last year that we presented work on as an oral and as a poster at uh, Eresmo in Barcelona this last weekend. This is a protein that we identified. It's an immune checkpoint in prostate cancer. Its expression is driven by the antigen receptor. We grow the patient's tumor in the dish called in organoid cultures and in the mice. We've shown a, a drug against this gene, against this protein, which is an antibody with a chemotherapy payload on it. So it's really a targeted chemotherapy. Really cures mice that have prostate cancers with this protein on it, but doesn't impact the cancers that don't have this protein on it. And we've now done a trial based on this work that I presented for the first time actually this weekend on Sunday. And you can see that in men really who have progressed, whose cancer has progressed on all available treatments, we are seeing stunning anti-tumor activity with this drug uh, against um, you know, these late stage prostate cancers. And we're now planning phase three trials with drugs targeting this protein B7H3, which is an immune checkpoint that's important for this disease. There are many other immunotherapy strategies being pursued, and we're really very excited about these uh, antibody constructs that make the killer T cells that kill the cancer cells 
essentially come close to the tumor cell and do what I call give the cancer cell the kiss of death. And uh, we have a number of trials running against this just now. And I have absolutely no doubt these are going to change patient care. So watch this space. But there are also CAR T cells being developed and many other ways to really try and prevent the cancer cell evading the immune system. Another big story that we published on in Nature in last November that we're pursuing further is we have shown that actually the tumor sucks in white blood cells called myeloid cells into the tumor. This is bad inflammation. And this is actually work based on a wonderful science in Imperial Jesus Gill. Jesus Gill at Imperial uh, published work almost 20 years ago that um, this process called the senescence associated secretory phenotype makes the cancer bring in these white blood cells to feed it. So the cancer is hijacking white blood cells to feed it. And essentially we had really done a lot of work leading to this uh, study showing that uh, if you look at the blood of these uh, men, if you find that these white blood cells are hijacked, the cancers have a much worse prognosis. We then show that the genes in the blood that actually uh, were being detected really were, you know, myeloid cell genes, these white blood cells that are usually involved in inflammation. We then went to them to show that drugs like abiraterone that I developed were really hugely impacted by this inflammation. If you had a lot of myeloid inflammation, drugs like abiraterone, enzalutamide, taxanes, even lutetium PSMA radiotherapy did not work as well. This is the paper we published on the chemotherapy. And many of these first authors are now professors elsewhere because one of our main jobs is to train the next generation. And then in collaboration with Andrea Alemonti and Bellinzona, who actually had shown in mice that these myeloid cells feed the cancer and cause therapy resistance. And based on Hesse's Gill's work from this in the cell paper of 2008, we then designed a hypothesis that these tumors are being fed by the myeloid cells, which we then tested um, in clinical trials. And we basically hypothesized that the tumor was secreting these um, chemotactic cytokines. There are a bit for the layman, a bit like Chanel number no. five, attracting the white blood cells into the tumor. It's a chemical signal that attracts the white blood cells down the smell into the tumor, these cytokines. And if we break this cycle, this, um, this cytokine white blood cell reaction through a receptor called CXCR2, we can stop these white blood cells getting in and block them feeding the cancer. And this is exactly what we've seen. So we've, uh, we published a paper in Nature in 2018 showing that actually as you go from therapy naive to therapy resistant prostate cancer, you have a huge increase in these white blood cells. We've shown these white blood cells have the receptor for this uh, hormone or channel number five that attracts these um, white blood cells into the tumor and causes this inflammation to feed the cancer. So we then run a trial with a drug that blocks this white blood cell migration into the tumor by blocking what's known as G-protein coupled receptors. And we did biopsies in men before and after this drug, before they started the, um, the trial at the very beginning. And we've shown the drug really blocks these blue cells getting in. So you can see a lot of blue cells here. They disappear after two weeks on the drug and you see major falls in the um, white blood cells through a hyperplex immunohistochemistry with 56 to color IHC on a three micron slide. And importantly, you know, the men that get the most myeloid fall in the tumor get tumor shrinkage and disease control that is often quite durable. So we've proven for the first time in prostate cancer that these myeloid immune cells are being hijacked by the cancer and feed its growth. So to close, you know, between us, I think it's fair to say that, you know, Hash and I can proudly say we've really changed prostate cancer medicine hugely in the last decade in detecting it and monitoring it and treating um, men suffering from these diseases. We've shown that there are many types of prostate cancer. And then the last bits of my slide, I've shown you that inflammation is a key driver of prostate cancer growth. And I published a review in Nature Reviews Cancer on this, inflammatory storms in prostate cancer biology, which I think is gonna be of huge importance to the field. Now this work is not my work alone, it's the work of many, many, many people. It takes a village as they say, so I should not take the credit alone. So thank you to all these people and especially the patients and their families who we serve. So thank you for your attention.